Board of Visitors has issued a report into the allegations after the prison service launched its own inquiry. But a solicitor representing some prisoners who claim to have been assaulted is demanding an independent inquiry. And Leomania has hit the West End of London. A few hours ago, the royal premiere of The Man in the Iron Mask was put on at Leicester Square. About 5,000 people, mostly teenage girls, you can hear them, waited outside for a glimpse of the star, Leonardo DiCaprio, seen here leaving the cinema in Leicester Square. Police said they'd rarely seen such crowds gathered for a premiere. There was some crushing. About a half a dozen girls were treated by St John's Ambulance. No one was seriously hurt. Much of New Zealand's biggest city has been without power for a month now. And despite promises, there's no sign of it being reconnected. Businesses have gone bust, and as winter approaches, locals in Auckland are getting angry. The power-starved people of Auckland taking to the streets to demand electricity. It's been a dismal four weeks since the lights first went out, devastating the local economy and the lives of those who depend on it. It's there all the time. I mean, you, you live, drink it, sleep it. You know, I mean, it's just, just an absolute bloody disaster. June Foster's gift shop in central Auckland has gone bankrupt due to the power crisis. Retailers and restaurant owners say trade has dropped by 90% since the crisis began. Candlelight has certainly lost its romance in this part of New Zealand. Shoppers are frightened to venture into the city. Many businesses have switched to operating out of suburban homes in an attempt to keep going. It's clear that it's not only money that people are needing. They're needing advice for their businesses, support as to how to manage uh, the pressures, strategies and experience to help support them. Auckland is New Zealand's largest city. It's the key commercial centre. At its worst, the power crisis blacked out the entire skyline. But an army of emergency generators has been shipped in, ensuring supplies for essential services. Many businesses are now moving back, and residents in high-rise apartments do now have their lifts working again. But many are still using the stairs, fearing more power cuts may trap them inside elevators. The city is now back operating on 40% power, but it could be another two months before full services are returned. The government has launched a special commission of inquiry into the crisis. The local power company is being blamed for scrimping on maintenance to increase profits. Engineers are working round the clock to restore normal power. There are four main cables supplying electricity to the city. All failed at once. The power shortage also threatened to stifle the arts as air conditioning systems failed in late summer heat. Opening night formalities, another though not much lamented casualty of the crisis. Please be comfortable, take your ties off, your jackets, and we're going to do the same thing. <laughs> How about that? You like it? Michael Peshart, BBC News. Auckland. Union leaders are heading for confrontation with the government if Tony Blair doesn't deliver what they want on employment rights. The leader of one of the biggest unions, Bill Morris of the Transport and General Workers, says he'll call for an emergency meeting of the whole union movement if the Prime Minister waters down Labour's manifesto commitment on union recognition. The mass ranks of union activists meet routinely every autumn. Tonight, one of the most powerful voices called for a special session because of discontent at the government, fearing Labour's reneging on a pledge to have employers deal with unions where employees vote for it. Bill Morris said his union, the TNG, wants the recall of the Congress to determine whether the union movement can support the government's proposal. Others echoed the call. We're fed up to the death with the uh, procrastination that's taken place. There are delays in uh, saying the things that we want to hear. Promises were made that uh, there would be repeal of certain anti-trade union legislation. It doesn't appear to be forthcoming. Are you prepared to support the reconvening of the TUC? The answer is yes, we are. Under Labour, union leaders now visit Downing Street. After the last time, the Prime Minister's staff said the meeting was positive but some union leaders said he was leaning to the employers, hence the discontent. 
The leader of the TUC was tonight trying to keep the peace and union unity. Well, I'm confident that uh, Labour will deliver in accordance with the commitments that it's given. And I think the arguments are very much on our side for extra fairness at work and a new set of relationships uh, between employer and employee. So we're expectant. Uh, there's a degree of apprehension as uh, we await the decision. Uh, but nonetheless, we're expectant that uh, we will get a fair white paper which will take workers forward in this country. 1976, with unions eyeball to eyeball with the Labour government over pay, was the last special session of the TUC. There's no doubt that a special meeting now would be seen as confrontational, producing hot public words, echoing hot, currently private words. Whatever now happens, the whole tone has changed. Some union leaders seem to be squaring up to the government. Threats are in the air. Any post-election signs of partnership seem to be vanishing. Stephen Evans, BBC News at the TUC. The United States has indicated it's about to ease its hardline policy towards its estranged communist neighbour, Cuba. A US official has said that direct air links and the export of hard currency to the Caribbean island could soon be established. But the move seems targeted at helping the Cuban people without assisting Fidel Castro's government. Key elements of US policy, such as the economic embargo and the Helms-Burton law, which discourages foreign investment in Cuba, will remain in force. Britain is still running out of telephone numbers, which means that six areas will have to have their codes changed again. The reason for the change is that, is that there's an increase in demand for more phone connections and computer connections for people to use the internet. The areas to get a new area code of 02 plus another digit are Coventry, Portsmouth, Southampton, Cardiff and Northern Ireland. The change will take place on April the 22nd in the year 2000. Londoners will also see a change when 0171 and 0181 are combined into a single 020 area code for the whole capital and there's no guarantee that other areas of the country won't have to change in the coming years. British scientists have identified a crucial component involved in the transmission of malaria. The disease, which kills more than two million people every year, affects almost half the globe, yet there's no effective method of preventing the disease. But, according to today's journal Nature, the, final, the finding rather could help control outbreaks of malaria and produce a disease-free mosquito in the future. Malaria is transmitted to humans by a female mosquito infected by a parasite. Once bitten, the parasite's saliva makes its way into the liver and eventually infects and kills red blood cells. It also affects the brain, liver and kidneys and can be fatal. 90% of the deaths are in Africa and most of them are children under five. Residual insecticides have been so successful that they have led to a new idea, total eradication of malaria. After the Second World War, scientists thought they'd won the battle against malaria by spraying insecticides. They were also looking for a molecule which may be the key to how the disease is transmitted. Fifty years later, a team of British scientists has found it, and one of them told News24 about their achievement. And what we've managed to do is to identify the molecule that the parasite uses to say, I'm no longer in man, I'm in the mosquito, I must do something very quickly or I'll die. Anti-malarial tablets, while essential, are not 100% effective, and the parasite has become increasingly resistant to drugs. But this discovery could lead to the possibility of breeding a strain of mosquitoes that won't be able to carry the parasite and spread the disease. Sue Nelson, BBC News. There's growing speculation that one of the directors of Newcastle United Football Club, who's at the centre of fans' protests, is to resign. Fans have refused to accept an apology over derogatory remarks that the two directors are alleged to have made about Newcastle women and the club's supporters. The outward quiet which had descended on St James's Park tonight belied the ferment within. A shock defeat by Crystal Palace last night had brought disaffection with the directors boiling to a head. But it was the damage done by unguarded comments from the chairman and his deputy which was causing most concern to the board. A public apology had failed to pacify Tyneside opinion and former chairman Sir John Hall and his beleaguered successor Freddie Shepherd, here on the right went into long session with their lawyers today. The pressure on Mr Shepherd and Vice Chairman Douglas Hall, thought to be abroad, was unremitting. They've dithered long enough. They should have come out earlier and either denied the allegations made on Sunday or uh, they should have come out and just said, hey, 
we apologise, we're very sorry, but after a few beers we said some stupid things. Speculation that at least one of the directors may go will not be relieved by the threat of more newspaper allegations on Sunday. We have more revelations of a similar nature. We have Hall uh, and Shepherd on tape and on video in fact. Uh, repeating uh, further slurs on the people of Newcastle, on their players and on the club in general. If the two do succumb to calls for their resignation, it'll mean a major overhaul of the company's financial structure. At the moment, Douglas Hall owns 57% of Newcastle shares. Freddie Shepherd has 8%, anonymous investors own 3%, and the rest belong to financial institutions and fans. So despite the clamour, still no decision about the two men's future, and time is running out. More damaging newspaper allegations on Sunday and a board meeting on Monday ahead of the half-yearly financial results could well determine the outcome of this affair. Mike Mackay, BBC News, Newcastle. It's a quarter to two. You're watching BBC News 24. Can you distinguish the man from the politician? There is what I call the higher truth and the lower truth. The catalyst from the conformist. And from that point, that time, that moment, I thought, OK, come as part of suicide. The leader from the legend. I've lived my life. I've made my mistakes. I hope I've made achievements as well. For the international interview that reveals the people behind the politics, the choice is hard talk. Tuesday to Saturday mornings at 3.30 on BBC News 24 and BBC One. I'll come back. Let's have a look at the headlines this morning. Ferry operators are predicting travel chaos as French strikers shut down the port of Calais. The last boat will leave Dover at about 2.30 this morning. Tony Blair has been told he should have declared a free trip to the British Grand Prix made in 1996 in the Register of Members' Interests. He was invited by the governing body of Formula One. And the Royal Pharmaceutical Society is calling for a review of the current system of dispensing methadone, the controlled drug often prescribed for heroin addicts. It says pharmacists are put at risk by the users. Now, it's exactly three years since the sarin nerve gas attack on the Tokyo underground, which killed 12 people. Mourners are expected to gather at central stations to mark the deaths this morning. Meanwhile, trials are continuing of members of the Om Supreme Truth sect who are accused of carrying out the attack. Our reporter, Juliet Hindle, is in Tokyo and joins me now. Juliet, have we seen any evidence of any mourning ceremonies going on in public yet? Well, what happens is they, they open little shrines in the stations where people were affected and people can go and pay their respects, leave flowers and so on. And that's expected to happen throughout the day. Now, even though this, uh, this attack is still very fresh in the minds of a lot of people in Japan, it seems that the sect itself is becoming once again a bit more popular. Yes, the National Police Agency estimates that there are 5,000 members of the cult now. Um, people are still joining and they're still recruiting new members. Um, they've got 28 facilities across the country and are believed to be um, gathering funds by selling computers in central Tokyo. Can you tell us what's the state of mind of the, the average Japanese citizen now? What is driving people to join this sect? Well, I think the, the Om cult at one point did have a very strong appeal to many people, and that appeal it remains the same. It's a place where you can belong, it's a place where you can escape from the rat race as well. And given that the Japanese economy is in a very bad state at the moment, it may once again find, uh, be, become a haven for some people. But, uh, well, okay, sure, some people are looking for havens, but surely now that the sect has been exposed as being quite so... Uh, extreme, I suppose. Uh, most people would surely think twice, wouldn't they? Well, you would hope so. Um, the cult now says that it is completely benign, it has no uh, acts of violence in mind, it doesn't produce chemical weapons, and indeed, since the cult's leader is still in prison and on trial, it may be that they are practicing a more peaceful way of life. Well, given the fact that he is on trial, along with many of the cult members, who's running the thing now? Well, 
in theory, his children are leaders of the cult, and they're only about seven and ten. But in practice, it's still the people who, like Shoko Asahara who have a grip over the minds of the members of the cult. OK, very quickly, Juliet, is the government doing anything to try and stop this? Well, they tried to stop it, but in fact, uh, the authorities said they couldn't use the anti-subversive activities law to ban the cult outright. All right, Juliet Hindle in Tokyo, thanks very much for joining us. Zimbabwe's president has insisted his government will go ahead and confiscate about 1,500 farms from their owners. Most of the farmers are white. Robert Mugabe's plan has been condemned both at home and abroad. White farmers there say it will wreck the economy and won't result in a fairer redistribution of land. One percent of Zimbabwe's population owns two-thirds of the country's land. The government wants to take over 12 million acres with only minimal compensation to the farmers, arguing that current ownership is a legacy of the colonial period, when the country used to be called Rhodesia, which must now be swept away. After four decades on the same cramped plot, John Nyari is getting tired of having to round up cattle whenever he wants to plough a field, tired of earning just 300 pounds a year, tired of seeing white farmers with all the best land. Some of the whites have two farms or three, hundreds of cattle, enough grazing area, but we black, we don't have that chance. I want more land to produce more so that I can feed the country. I'm not working for my own, I'm working for the country. This man used to work for the country in a very different role. Ian Smith led its last white regime in the days when Zimbabwe was called Rhodesia. He declared independence illegally and fought to maintain a situation where whites who make up 1% of the population have two-thirds of the best farmland. He is still fighting. Now it's to stop his own farm being confiscated. He says whites had a perfect right to come here and take the land they wanted. We came here, our ancestors, the pioneer column, with the blessing of the then Queen of England because we were spread in the area that was coming under the Union Jack and Western civilization. That was Rhodes's dream and we were part of that. We came here in order to establish this kind of civilization and way of life. So if they come to take your farm, will you give it to them? Well, I've already told them they can't have it, you see, because it's my farm. It's my home farm. It's been our home for 50 years. Some white farmers are now saying the government's plans are falling apart, that people like Mr. Smith needn't worry, because the original list of 1,500 farms has been secretly whittled down to around 200, and they'll be able to stay on the rest. The president denies it point blank. If they're going to stay where they are, well and good, uh, after the farms have been taken, but uh, rest assured we're going to take the farms. So the policy's not been dropped? No, the policy hasn't been dropped. How could we drop a policy of that nature? So the full weight of international opinion counts for less than the hopes and dreams of Mr Mugabe's core supporters. People here shed blood in order to fight for their land. And they want it. And any political leader must address that question or else they go. So President Mugabe has a real fight on his hands now on what is quite literally vital ground for his people. He knows that if he loses, they may define his presidency as a failure. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, Zimbabwe. Workmen preparing the site of Manchester Airport's second runway have uncovered artefacts dating back more than 6,000 years. A thorough exploration is being paid for by the airport authorities and it's thought the site could have been a Bronze Age farm. On a site where the jet aircraft of the 21st century will take off and land, evidence of human habitation 6,000 years ago. The earliest remains so far discovered are prehistoric flints used by hunters in the Mesolithic era. And there are artifacts from every stage of history. This pottery from a 17th century farm had lain buried for 300 years. In a project financed by Manchester Airport, archaeologists have been given the opportunity to examine the site. It's 6,000 years of history here. There's been more or less continuous occupation 
uh, from the Mesolithic right through the Bronze Age with the Bronze Age farmstead, a bit of Roman and Iron Age as far as we're aware of, right through to the 17th, 18th century. And that, that's what's interesting about it. For the archaeologists, one of the most exciting discoveries was evidence of a Bronze Age roundhouse from which they were able to create this impression of how the site might have looked in 2000 BC. While this excavation is of great interest, it's not thought to be worth preserving. To anyone except an expert, it looks like any other hole in the ground. The archaeologists have another three weeks to discover the secrets of this site. Two years from now, this whole area will be buried beneath three feet of concrete. Kevin McKay, BBC News at Manchester Airport. Now, Leo Mania hit the West End of London a few hours ago with the royal premiere of the film The Man in the Iron Mask. About 5,000 people, mostly screaming teenage girls, waited outside for a glimpse of the star Leonardo DiCaprio, seen there just leaving the Odeon Cinema in Leicester Square. Police say they've rarely seen such crowds gather for a premiere. There was some crushing, about half a dozen people were treated by St John's Ambulance, but no one was seriously hurt. Now, time for a look at the weather. Here's Helen Willits. Hello, 15 degrees yesterday, a warm one as well in the sunshine down at South Sea. And today we're looking to beat nearly 11 hours of sunshine down in Guernsey. But I do think that with this weak weather front slipping southwards down the east of the country, we could see a bit more cloud during today. But the high pressure, of course, means that most places will stay dry. Now, through the night, we've seen the cloud thickening up across Northern Ireland, Scotland too, and that will continue to spill its way into Northern England, parts of North Wales, the Midlands as well, I think. Most places dry, though, but some drizzly rain possible in northern and western exposed parts of Britain. The more persistent rain during today confined to the Northern Isles, I think, for most of the day. Further south, the clear skies, the light winds, a recipe for frost and fog. We could have some pockets of fog, particularly near river valleys this morning, and I think it's going to be quite a chilly start as well with a widespread frost, ground frost that is, in many parts of southern England, Wales too, and some places down to freezing. Now, those early morning mist and fog patches will soon start to burn away once the sun comes up. They should be gone by the middle of the morning, but early morning travellers beware of the odd fog patch. A bit more cloud further north, and we could have some misty low cloud in parts of northwest England, northern Ireland, northern and western parts of Scotland too, perhaps a little bit of hill fog. Mostly dry though, some spits and spots of drizzle around northern and western parts and that more persistent rain in the north. Once it brightens up, a good deal of sunshine in the south and the west. But as we go through the afternoon, I think we could see some more clouds spilling down the North Sea coast and just drifting into parts of eastern England. So perhaps more cloud there than yesterday. Perhaps you'll spot a drizzle by tea time in parts of East Anglia, Lincolnshire as well. But by then, the rain in the north becoming confined, I think, mostly to the Northern Isles, but always cloudy in the north and the western Scotland. Can't rule out the odd spot of drizzle. Generally speaking, bright in most places, it's the best of the sunshine in the southwest. Despite that chilly start, I think we'll see temperatures rising quite smartly again 12 13 mild for the time of year and it will feel rather warm in the sunshine once again a little bit more detail then most of the cloudy weather and the drizzly rain in the north and the west of scotland brightening up in the southeast i think a little bit of sunshine by this afternoon as well and the more persistent rain by then in the northwest Rather a grey start the western side of northern England, I think, this morning. Brighter, probably, in the east, but then clouding over down the eastern side this afternoon. Perhaps brightening up, though, in the west. And down the southeast, a little bit of early morning mist and fog, particularly around by rivers and lakes, but brightening up this afternoon. Perhaps a bit more cloud in the east by the end of the day. A spot of drizzle possible. One programme doesn't just reflect the news, it makes it. I don't think anything had prepared me for the bullying and the manipulation. When mothers were working, children were doing less well in school. Our environment is made up not just of our rural areas, but also of our towns. When the moment came, he brought the sword out. You've got a knife in your hand and you're going for the person that you love. Or even ten pence. I think she could have been saved. Why watch tonight's news when you can watch tomorrow's Panorama, Monday at 10 o'clock on BBC One. There are people all over the UK. It could be Leeds. These men are behaving suspiciously. A check is made on their Volkswagen Scirocco. It's stolen. It could be Dover. Hello there. The occupants say they've already been stopped. Have a quick look in the back. It could be Glasgow. Most parents, it seems, don't want to leave anything to chance. You can direct the stories that are close to home. This morning at 4.30 on News 24 and BBC One.
Hello, you're watching BBC News 24. Welcome. If you've just joined us, I'm Taymor Mabini. These are the headlines at 2 o'clock. The last ferry leaves for Calais in under half an hour as French strikers prepare to shut down the port. Criticism for Tony Blair as he fails to declare a free trip to Silverstone. And Leo Mania in London. DiCaprio delights his fans. Ferry passengers and lorry drivers will face major disruption in just a short while from now when French dockers stage a 24-hour strike at Calais. The port will be closed to protest about plans to end duty-free sales around Europe. The French workers say thousands of jobs are under threat. 20,000 day-trippers heading for Calais have been told they won't be able to set sail at all today. And car and lorry drivers leaving Dover will be rerouted through Zeebrugge in Belgium, which is a much longer four-hour crossing. The 24-hour blockade of Calais and Boulogne starts at 5.45 this morning, and British hauliers say it'll cause widespread disruption. It does mean that trucks have to divert. It means that they cannot guarantee reliable deliveries. It means they don't know when they're going to be arriving. And it means, of course, that they're subjected to additional costs. All of that adds up to a, a, a mighty pain in the neck and an unnecessary pain in the neck. And it's caused by French strikers. The French government really ought to get a grip on this situation and stop it. French unions are angry about European Union plans to end lucrative duty-free sales in July next year. They say thousands of jobs will be lost in France and across Europe. And they fear trade to the ports of Calais and Boulogne could dry up. British ferry companies are sympathetic but say it's a misguided protest. I don't agree with it. I mean, if they want to, if they actually want to sort of uh, strike to show their feelings about the abolition of duty free and fear about, about jobs, I more than I more than understand. I just wish they would disrupt possibly the traffic in the Champs Elysees instead. Euro tunnel bosses have held a series of meetings after threats that the strikers would try to block Channel Tunnel trains. A spokesman said any such attempt would be regarded as illegal, and the French authorities would be asked to act accordingly. Paul Royal, BBC News. A committee of MPs has ruled that Tony Blair should have declared a free trip to the British Grand Prix in the Register of Members' Interests. He was the guest of the governing body of Formula One motor racing in 1996. The ruling by the Commons Standards and Privileges Committee has led Conservatives to accuse the Prime Minister of hypocrisy. Mr Blair, though, insists he went to meet business people, not to watch the racing. Tony Blair didn't declare a free family visit to the British Grand Prix in 1996, and he should have done, say both the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner and the Standards and Privileges Committee. Joining the Chancellor today at a school meeting to take questions on the budget, Mr Blair didn't respond to those who asked about the criticism. Prime Minister, are you going to answer questions about uh, the Register of Interest and your visit to the Grand Prix? He'd seen his trip to Silverstone, he left soon after the Grand Prix began, as an official visit which needn't be declared, not a chance to watch motor racing. But six other MPs did declare the same visit, and the rules make no distinction between private and official visits. We say he should have registered it, it was registrable, uh, and uh, he thought it was not registrable and offered to make amends by putting it in the register subsequently. At Silverstone, Mr Blair did meet Formula One chief Bernie Eccleston, whose £1 million election donation to Labour was later returned on the Standards Commissioner's advice. And though MPs accept the Prime Minister's was merely a technical offence, his motor racing trip was well reported, the Tories have exploited Mr Blair's embarrassment. A year later, he was in the mire of the Formula One allegations that Formula One and the FIA had received preferential treatment from the government. So this is a result of hypocrisy, arrogance, feeling that he's above the rules, above the law, because power's gone to his head. Opposition leaders get many invitations. William Haig is now extra careful to take advice on what he should declare in the MP's register. And Downing Street says the Commissioner's report has been helpful in clearing up grey areas. But the Tories say the areas weren't that grey and that an apology is called for. The Prime Minister hasn't been rebuked, but the Commissioner says his view was mistaken. It's a teacup-sized kerfuffle, but it's one that Mr Blair could have done without. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. The Royal Pharmaceutical Society is calling for a review of the current system of dispensing methadone. Methadone is the controlled drug that's often prescribed for heroin addicts. Pharmacists who now dispense more than one million prescriptions of the drug every year say their staff are at risk from the users. Britain is still running out of telephone numbers, which means...